Alright. Good evening. Magandang, magandang gabi, Pilipinas. Uh, thank you uh, for being here at the Philippine.net Users Group uh, first online dev sessions for uh, for 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 February 2021. Oh, let me mute myself over <laughs> another. All right. Uh, uh, yeah. So let me introduce myself. I'm John Limhap. I'm a lead. Uh, I lead the uh, Philippine.NET users group and the community lead. And uh, I'm also a .NET developer. I work for a company called uh, PageUp as a principal developer. Um, yeah, making, making software products with, with .NET. And um, tonight we have a very special guest. Um, he hails from uh, Florida. And um, he's actually a .NET developer advocate at a company called uh, Vonage. Um, personally, I only heard about Vonaj when it, uh, when I log into my GitHub account, I get my 2FA and Vonaj is, is what sends the 2FA code. But apparently they do a lot of really interesting, interesting things there. Um, and, 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 uh, yeah, it's a lot more than just, uh, SMS. So, uh, um, without further ado, I, I, I'm giving you over to our speaker tonight. Uh, Steve Lorello. He's fr again. He's from. Uh, he is from Florida. It's very early there, so so we thank him for for getting up here. And he's going to talk about an intro to computer vision in .NET, and along with that, you know, interesting stuff like machine learning and and so on. So uh, 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 I'll not uh, make this any longer, uh, and I'll give the stage over to Steve. Thank, thank you for you. being here. Thanks, John. Looking forward to speaking to you all. Um, so, hi, everyone. My name is Steve Lorello, um, and I'm going to be presenting to you a brief introduction to computer vision in .NET. So, of all the topics in computing, um, computer vision is probably my favorite. With it, you get to take a set of fairly abstract mathematical concepts and apply them to something that's really powerful and useful. Now, if any of you have ever dabbled in raw computer vision techniques before, you're probably like me. You mostly mostly use either Python or C++, both of which are very useful, but they can be a little limiting when it comes to um, client-side applications. And that's why I'm actually really excited to explore its applications in .NET. So a good place to start is to ask a question, what is computer vision? And to answer that, I'll use a quote that my computer vision professor in grad school borrowed from another computer vision researcher. The goal of computer vision is to write computer programs that interpret images. Now, there's two concepts we need to unpack here. First, what are we interpreting? And second, and maybe more fundamentally, what's a digital image? So here's a bit of an agenda of what we're going to be covering. First, we're going to tackle that existential question. What is a digital image? Then we'll be doing a little bit of basic code with OpenCV and .NET. Then we'll start diving into that interpreting part of our definition. We're going to start looking at convolution and edge detection. Then we'll actually look at convolutional neural networks and look at building a neural net to classify images of dogs using a WhatsApp chatbot. Next, We'll look at facial detection, and then we'll be doing some real-time facial detection with Vonage's video API. And finally, we'll start looking at some feature tracking and image projection, if we have time at the end. So first off, uh, for our first question, what's an image? So here's an image of my muse for this presentation, uh, my dog, Zero. Get used to him. You're going to be seeing a little bit of him. So what is a digital image? An image, um, when you break it down, is really just a function. That function denotes a quantized sample of intensity values along a two-dimensional grid. Those intensity values, otherwise known as pixels, denote light intensity along an arbitrary range. For example, a byte, 0 to 255. There's no rule that says that the light intensities have to lie along that, that range 0 to 255. It's just a convention because that's the size of a byte. And oftentimes when we're looking at grayscale, 
those numbers will actually be on the range of negative one to one or zero to one. But technically, these values, as long as they're along a bounded range, the math will still hold. And actually, when you start getting into other applications of image processing, for example, HDR, the ranges of values are exponentially larger and technically infinite. So that image of zero that we saw before is, a si is of size n by m by three. So n is the height of this image. It's the number of pixels that comprise the height. m is the width, and then there's three channels. Those three channels are just the light intensity for a particular color. Um, in that instance, uh, blue, green, and red. So this picture here is a picture of a pepper and it's actually a classic example for looking at an image as a function in a one-dimensional space. So grayscale makes actually things a lot easier to think about here, but the math is gonna to abstract to any number of channels that you might wanna use. For example, the one you're probably used to is RGB, red, green, blue. Take a look at this red line drawn through this pepper here. You can think of that line, this actual line as its own image. Um, which is only one dimension. And that image um, just denotes light intensity values. And if you look at this graph on the right, that's actually those light intensities graphed on the right here. Now, that insight where like the lighter spots are higher intensities and the darker spots are lower intensities actually is very powerful. And we'll take a look a little bit later in this talk about how that's applied. But I just want you to think briefly about where the edges in this images are. Where are they, where is the color changing in this image? Is it in the peaks of this little graph on the right here? Is it in the valleys or is it somewhere in between them? So now we'll be taking a look at the topic of this talk, using computer vision and .NET. So in this talk, I'm going to use, be using OpenCV and uh, ML.NET. Um, OpenCV is uh, the open source computer vision library. And as the name suggests, it's an open source tool. It's pretty widely adopted. Um, and there are other tools that do essentially the same thing as OpenCV does. MATLAB or Octave, for example. It has a lot of, they have a lot of powerful image processing functionality, but I like OpenCV as, for the most part, it's free to use and the docs are pretty user-friendly. Um, in addition to explaining how to do something, they, as a bonus, sort of explain the math and insights that behind what everything does. MGUCV is a .NET OpenCV wrapper that we'll be looking at here. It's widely available in the .NET framework and does enable you to do quite a lot. Um, for the most part, there seems to be a one-to-one -one mapping between what M OpenCV provides and what MGUCV provides. So most things you can accomplish with OpenCV, you can also accomplish with MGU. I will note that if you're like me and you're used to the Python version of OpenCV, you might need a little time to adjust to MGU as it's much closer to the original C++ implementation. Um, and just a note, it, MGU does use a dual open source and commercial license. So to actually use OpenCV, you just create a new project. Um, for these, we'll be basically using um, just a a console app for the basic ones, and then we're going to be using a WPF app later. Um, then you just install the MGU CV runtime package or the package manager. So for example, mgu.cv.runtime, and I'm on Windows, so .windows. So now let's look at just a little bit of code here. MGU CV is structured around a bunch of static functions in a class called CV invoke. Here we're using three of them. Now, I've stored an image in the resource directory of this um, project called zero.jpg. And that file is just copied down to the build directory when I run it. So I'm just assuming it's going to be there. Now, this first line here actually reads the image of zero into a matrix. So this bar here is becoming a matrix. As you're doing this, there's two things to note. First, the matrices that we're dealing with are by default read into the BGR space, that's blue, green, red, rather than the RGB space that you might be used to. It's the same thing, um, it's just the channels are flipped. Also, the structures here are all iDisposable, so you can call dispose on them if you wanna close, close them out immediately. 
The second line creates a window with a title provided by the first argument here and displays the image from the second argument here. And so you call CV invoke dot wait key, this final line here, that's similar to waiting for a console input. It just waits for you to press the key while you're focused on the image window. Um, without that call, the image would just disappear and you wouldn't get to see it. So I'll just show you that real quick. So this is a very basic um, use of this library. So you just hit show image, just play, and there he is. There's a kind of zero just kind of lounging around the house. All right, let me shut that down real quick. So now that we've covered that very basic code, the next topic I want to talk about is convolution. So convolution is the process of combining two functions to produce a third. When we're working with images, this generally means taking a large matrix, um, which would be our image, and running a small matrix or a kernel or a filter over it to produce a third matrix uh, called a feature image, which is where we'll actually see, gain a lot of our insights. So this operation is essentially what's happening here. Notice this shaded region of this image right here, this three by three submatrix inside of the image. That three by three submatrix is the same size as the filter or kernel that we're running over the image. And that's because we're dotting this kernel against this submatrix to produce each individual entry in our output matrix. So you don't need to necessarily, you don't need to know how to produce dot, dot products, the software will just take care of all this for you. But these two pieces are being combined together to produce each individual cell in this feature image. So you run this filter or kernel over the whole image and you produce a feature image. Now, typically like 51 wouldn't be the out output here. You would actually sum up this whole kernel and then divide it from the feature image. So that should produce four, but this basic operation convolution becomes very important when you're dealing with um, image processing. Now I'd like to actually illustrate why convolution is such a powerful tool when we're thinking about computer vision. We can do, a really uh, we can do some really cool stuff with it and to accomplish these things, the only thing we need to tune is the kernel that we're using. So this kernel here, this filter is called a Sobel operator. The Sobel operator enables you to do something really critical, edge detection. So recall that image of the pepper that we looked at earlier. You remember when I asked you where the edges were? Were they in the peaks, um, in the valleys, or somewhere in between? Well, the correct answer is actually in between. So if you took at some point or uh, can't even remember taking calculus, you may have heard of something called a derivative. A derivative is simply a rate of change between two points on a function. It's a slope. And it's the derivatives that the Sobel operator is going to calculate for each pixel in the image. Remember how I said convolution is combining two functions or images to produce a third? Well, that's exactly what we're doing here. We're combining our input image and our kernel function to produce a third function or an image. An image showing the magnitude of the derivatives, also noted as the gradients and probably more clearly referred to as the edges of the image. So these two Sobel operators here um, are the two classic Sobel operators. They produce the gradients in X and the gradients in Y. And after combining the two, you actually get a full gradient image. So just to recap here, we're essentially going to be looking at how the color changes between every pixel in the in an image, and that those rates of change are going to show us where the edges are in the image. So let's illustrate this. Here's my buddy again, uh, Zero, in his Mr. Rogers sweater. That's what I like to call it, at least. Notice all the edges in this image. When you think about it, those edges, the places where the color is changing really rapidly, that's sort of where all the information is. 
the flat surface is like this wall in the background here or the tile floor over here. They don't really tell you that much about what's going on in the image. And I honestly think that his cuteness is a subjective reading of the contours of the color in the image. So after running a convolution with a Sobel operator over our image of zero, we're left with the gradient outline of all the edges in the image. Those are the parts that are very bright. Now, the operation of convolution has a wide array of applications, particularly around feature detection, which we can leverage in something else you might have heard of, a convolutional neural network, which is a topic for um, that we're going to get to a little bit later. So if you want to calculate the Sobel gradients for an image, here's the process. So I'm assuming that the color, the images that I'm reading in are color, they're in the BGR space. So the first thing I need to do is actually convert those um, color images to grayscale images. And that's actually what this first line is doing here. Um, it's taking our input image and restoring in this gray image uh, conversion between the BGR space, the blue, green, red space, and the gray space. Um, the next line here, this Gaussian blur, is something that you're going to see quite a lot of when you're looking at image processing. Uh, Gaussian blur actually blurs the image, which is actually a good thing, and it's something that we really quite like to do, and I'll explain why in a little bit. This next bit here is actually calculating those gradients um, in X and in Y. So you pass in the grayscale image, you pass in the output image that you want to store it in, and then we pass in this data type here. This is the data type that the output image is going to be stored in. And you'll notice that it's a six, uh, CV16S, which is a 16-bit short. And the reason we store it in the 16-bit short as opposed to 8-bit uh, byte is because as we're performing this operation, this convolution operation, it's actually possible for the pixels to overflow and um, spell over the 255 limit. So we put them, we output them into the 16-bit short temporarily. And then we pass in the dimension we want to calculate next, and then Y, and the kernel size that we want to use. After that, we actually have to convert the um, the 16-bit shorts back into 8-bit bytes, and then finally combine the two together to actually produce our final images. So as you see here, the gradient image in X and the gradient image in Y. Notice how they're actually pretty different from each other. You'll notice that the gradient image in X, all the vertical lines appear, and the gradient image in Y, all the horizontal lines appear. Now, why is that? Well, when you think about it, the way that this is calculating the gradients, it's scanning this way in X. So it's scanning left to right. So it can't, it's, it doesn't detect the horizontal lines because those are perpendicular to the vertical. So when we're looking and we're scanning left to right in here, we see, we see the lines that are perpendicular to the, uh, to the uh, solo operator that we're using. And so it actually detects the vertical lines in spite of the fact that X is the horizontal um, bit of the Cartesian plane. And the converse is true for Y. And that's actually why we need to calculate both so that we can get this nice final result here. And you'll see, after I've combined the two together, we get this really nice vertical and set, set of vertical and horizontal lines, and we still have a very good idea of what's going in our initial going on in our initial image, but it's just black and white, and we basically removed all the other information, all the extraneous information for that. So that's actually how you do edge detection. Let me show you this real quick before I move on. This is um I might not have pulled this up. Oh wait, no, here it is. So this is that same bit of code that we just looked at. It just has some M shows and a couple in writes and a couple other things, but it's just it just this is the basic operation that we just talked about. So I'll just turn this um. on. Steve, sure. can you zoom in a bit? Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, for, for the code, yeah. Hold on. Great, thank you. That better? All right. Yep. So, 
Thank you. So like I said, this is the gradient image in X. You see all the uh, vertical lines are showing up. Then we have the gradient image in Y, all the horizontal lines are showing up. And we combine them together. And we have this nice gradient image of zero. All right. Cool. So probably the most ubiquitously used kernel is the Gaussian kernel. Lots of operations in computer vision will run what's called a Gaussian blur over an image prior to using it in other CV functions. For example, the Sobel operator we just saw. Gaussian might sound familiar. If you've ever taken statistics or probability, it's just another way of saying a normal distribution or a bell-shaped curve. We start with some sensor pixel and then we work our way out from that pixel. And the further we get away from that uh, mean value, the less weight we give to each individual pixel in the kernel as we're summing it up. And these values just scale as the kernel expands. So one thing that really confused me when I started learning about computer vision was why blurring was so useful. And the reason it's useful is actually because digital camera sensors tend to add a lot of noise to them. Even a little bit of noise can really throw off a lot of these techniques. Blurring digital image images, which might make them a little less detailed to our eyes, actually helps remediate this noise and removes it so the image can be more cleanly used by these image processing programs. So to illustrate this to you, um, let's look at some images with some salt and pepper noise added to them. Now the noise off the digital camera sensor isn't necessarily that bad, this bad, but this is that image of the pepper we saw before, and this is an image of Einstein. Look at all the noise in here. This is just static, this is just standard noise that could be added by a camera sensor. And think about what this is going to do to our edge detection technique that we just looked at. It's going to really hamper it because the salt and pepper noise is essentially distorting the oscillation between different pixels. And it could show a lot of extra noise in the um, output image. So here we're just gonna go from our original to our blurred. Um, now, like I said, blurring loses detail for, the uh, for us, but it actually gains clarity for these programs. Now, on the left here, you, another thing you can do is actually sharpen an image. So if you take this blurred image and you subtract it from the original image, you're actually left with this detail image right here. And if you take this detail image, that's the detail that you can use to sharpen it. You can just add that back to the original image and you get this nice sharpened image. Now it's probably easier to look at these two side by side. So look at this original image at zero and then look at the sharpened image at zero and see how much sharper this image is, how much more precise these things look, as opposed to when you're blurring and you actually um, un unweight the center pixels, you're essentially upweighting the center pixels for each of these. So you give each pixel more prominence in the output image. Now, if you over sharpen, so like here's 10x detail, you'll actually wash out the image and you'll see that these weird artifacts kind of start to show up. So now that we've spoken about convolution, we're going to take a little bit of a look at neural networks and convolutional neural networks, which are just networks with some convolution editing. So an artificial neural network is a decision system inspired by a biologic neural network. It's a collection of nodes modeled into bi modeled on biological neurons called artificial neurons. These artificial neurons are arranged into layers. The input layer, some set of hidden layers, some set of hidden layers, and an output layer. This input layer, as the name suggests, where the input comes into, the hidden layers are uh, preceding functions that feed forward to the other hidden layers in the output layer. And the result of these functions, the output, are whether this is active or not and actually speak to like whether it's able to classify something or not. So here's the anatomy of an artificial neuron. You'll see the input and weight 
links on the left coming from the previous layers and feeding into this input function. So you have your input links and you have the weights for each individual neuron that's firing into each successive neuron. This input function then feeds into this activation function, which basically says whether this neuron is gonna fire or not, and then it outputs. And those output links also have weights. This activation function is usually some nonlinear function like a, a integrated Gaussian or something. Um, now, neural networks allow us to do a bunch of really neat things, for example, classification, though there are some important limitations. So the last thing we need to talk about, which is regular neural nets, is, um, and this is what really makes them very powerful, is backward propagation. And this is sort of how they learn. When you seed a neural network, those weight lengths that we spoke about earlier, um, those are the weights that each neuron provides for all of its inputs. Um, and when it's being initialized, it doesn't have any uh, preconceived notions as to what those weights are supposed to be. And the way that it learns is by updating those weights. So when it's when it sees something is wrong, it downweights the neurons that fed it incorrect information. And when it's right, it upweights the neurons that fed it the correct information. And to do this, it actually takes the results and then backward propagates that to all the other layers of the neural network. Essentially, it's punishing neurons for being wrong and rewarding them for being right. And yeah, that's that's backward propagation. It's actually what really makes neural networks so powerful. Now, there are some pretty significant limitations when you're talking about a standard neural net. With dealing with small sample sizes and linear decision boundaries, neural nets can be quite limited in what they can do. You might want to use something more like a KNN or something like that, a K-nearest neighbors. It's only when we start to build uh, start building off a fair sized data set with large, well-tuned layers in the uh, in the network that the neural nets really hit their stride. On the other hand, when you're looking, when you're trying to do classification on images, neural networks on their own are quite limiting. Um, for perceptrons, the layers are fully connected. So if we look back at this thing, fully connected means that each neuron is connected to each neuron in the next layer and vice versa. So each neuron in each layer is connected to each neuron in the previous layer. So think about that when you're dealing with an image, like we said before, is n height, m width, and has three channels. You're talking about something that now needs n by m by y lengths between each neuron. So every neuron has, you know, in that picture of zero we saw before is uh, 1536 by 2048. So you have close to 3 million uh, or a million different connections between the input layer uh, between the input and each layer of the in the ne uh, neural network. So even if you decimated that down to one eighth scale, it's still like forty nine thousand links. So the combinatorics don't really favor that approach. And that's actually where we bring convolution back into the equation. So that brings us to convolutional neural networks, which are neural networks with you guessed it, convolution added in. So convolutional neural network is, as the name suggests essentially a combination of these two techniques, convolution and neural networks. Rather than feeding each individual pixel from the input layers into the hidden layer, directly, we have intermediary layers of convolution to build feature maps and then pooling to reduce the feature maps down to manageable chunks while minim minimizing loss of information. After these successive layers of convolution and subsampling, the resulting set of inputs into our neural network are actually quite small and limited and quite useful because they actually just, you know, say what features the thing has as opposed to like just a large un unconvolved mess of pixels. So you'll see, you'll take like a robot and maybe you're looking for, maybe one of your features that you're looking for is the hand of the robot. So you'll run that over it and you'll actually get the spot where that where that hand is, and you just subsample down and run more convolutions over it, subsample down, and so you have this nice set of confined inputs, which are relatively small that you can then feed through your neural network. So we can actually use this in .NET 
And in this case, we'll be building a chatbot which will detect different dog breeds sent over social media channels. For example, I'll use WhatsApp in this case. For our image classification, we're going to be using um, machinelearning.net. This is a machine learning library available to C Sharp and F Sharp programmers. It runs in this and it runs cleanly in the CLR. TensorFlow, um, specifically the ML.NET TensorFlow library, is what we'll be using to construct our convolutional neural network. Essentially, we'll be using ML.NET to build the pipelines and TensorFlow to do the decision making. And finally, we'll be using the Vonage APIs to build the chatbot. And by the end of this, you'll be able to ask the chatbot via WhatsApp what type of dog you're looking at. And you'll be able to tell the chatbot what kind of dog something is and allowing it to grow smarter with time. So for the sake of brevity, I'm not going to review how to set the entire pipeline, hence the ellipses. But it's a few lines of code that will determine how the input is uh, pre-processed. So what size the input, uh, what size the input images are going to be decimated down to, um, like how the colors are going to be extracted, and then it loads up a pre-built TensorFlow model called Inception, which is a popular model. It's just so you don't have to build it yourself. Um, you don't have to tune the whole neural network. There's actually a, a fairly popular data set out there that I, I used for the sample. On the other hand, we'll be um, we'll fit some training data to our model. And that model is what we're going to be using for the classification. But at the end of this pipeline build, we just essentially take some data from, I have this train tags, that uh, TSV file that we're loading all the data in from. And you just use that as your training data. And then you actually have something that can be, that you can classify with. So you have, your end result of this is, is this model. Um, this next method here is what we're going to be using to actually perform the detection. And this prediction right here is where we're going to store the output. So we just get an image data, a bit of image data with a image path. We initialize a predictor from that model we looked at earlier. And we call predict on that with the image data. And we have a prediction. After we've got, gone ahead and detected what type of dog we're talking about, we'll reply back to whoever the user is that sent us the message um, to tell them what our prediction was. Uh, I, this is going to be in a, a regular MVC controller. I'm dependency injecting a config that has an app ID and a private key path that I'm going to use for actually, um, those are some user secrets that Vonage needs. I'll extract those credentials and that enables me to essentially send a WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger or Fiber message or SMS message for that matter um, using the Vonage uh, messages API. Next, I'll just build a request structure it's going to be a text with a dog prediction. It's going to be, like I said, going over WhatsApp. The two is the two number from is from number. Um, and I'm going to build this whole request, and then I'm just going to send it with this last bit of uh, last bit of code right here. So let me just show you that real quick. Um, actually, it's already up and running. But this is that same bit of code that you were just talking about. And I was training it before, I was training it yesterday. I don't know if I can actually zoom in on uh, zoom in with this thing. So you'll forgive me if the um, a bit janky. You see it uh so I actually trained it with a specific image of a dachshund, but I'm not sure if anyone's going to be able to read that. So I apologize because I don't think I could zoom in with this um, desktop version of WhatsApp, but it's saying I'm about 90% sure that what you sent me is a dachshund. And I can send like a picture of my greyhound honey and let's see how it does with that. One second. So I sent this picture of my Greyhound honey, and it says it's about 57% sure that it's um, a Greyhound, 
which isn't great. But if I did train Greyhound, and I sent that same picture over, it'll update itself. So the next time I send, maybe not the same picture because that's cheating, but um, I'll send another very similar picture. And this time it's 86% sure. So it gets more and more certain the more information that it sees. And what it's doing is essentially taking that image, saving it, adding it to its model, updating itself, and um, pushing everything back out. And this is all being done with uh, .NET, ML.NET, and TensorFlow. So anyway, um, let's move on to something else that's really cool. And let me stop showing that and go back over to my presentation. I just realized that I haven't moved off of that yet. Uh, face detection. And using OpenCV, we can actually run face detection in real time on multiple video streams. So we're going to be discussing a technique for facial detection developed by Paul Viola and Michael Jones, which is both really rapid and robust. Uh, we'll take we'll take these little masks called Har-like features, which we'll see in a minute are just very simple little shapes. With them, in what's called an integral image, generated from our input image, we'll determine the relative shading of different regions in that input image. And after combining a lot of these Har-like features, we can build what's called a cascading classifier to perform facial detection. These Har-like features, as they're called, are simple black and white images split into two, sometimes three, sometimes four different rect rectangles. They may look like silly little shapes, but they're actually extremely useful when it comes to running all sorts of detection algorithms. And particularly here, we're gonna be looking at using them in facial recognition. So one or two of them by themselves aren't particularly useful, but hundreds of them applied at varying scales to the same image against the well two model produces a really robust and uh, probably more importantly, very fast. And I mean, can run in real time on multiple video streams with low overhead fast. But wait, you're asking, you're probably asking yourself, you're running hundreds or thousands of these at the same time. You have to sum up all the pixels under both regions of the um, image of this Harlight feature and subtract them from each other at varying scales. So how could this possibly work pre uh, performantly? And the answer is actually at the core of the Viola Jones algorithm. So an integral image. Um, and we thought we were done with our calculus terms for the day. So if you might recall what an integral is, an integral is just the area under a curve. That's the sum of everything up to a certain point in the function. And that's exactly what these are. Remember I said that an image at the end of the day is just a function? Well, that's this is probably a slightly more extreme version of that. But what an integral image is, is every pixel in the image becomes the sum of every pixel above and to the left of that pixel. So this one right here, this this pixel is 10. So that's, um, I guess that actually, that doesn't really, that we're all this. I didn't, yeah, I didn't check this, that's fine. But the, the point is that these, every pixel in here is supposed to add up to every pixel above and to the left of it in the, in the integral image. And what does that do for us? Well, those hard light features we were looking at before require us to sum the white area and the black area and find the difference between those areas. And that summation is on the order of n by m, where n is the height and m is the width of that feature. And now that might be acceptable for one feature, but this algorithm requires to do lots of them to robustly detect faces. So this diagram actually illustrates why the integral image makes this algorithm so much faster. So to find this red rectangle here, we need to take the bottom right point, subtract the bottom left point, um, the top right point, and then add back the top left point. And how does that work? Well, remember, D is this entire region here. So that's the sum of all the pixels in this region. 
C is the sum of everything over here. B is the sum of everything up here. So we just need to cancel out B and C, and then we need to unnegate the double negated portions that of the overlap between B and C. And so that allows us to, in an order one operation, calculate this whole region in here using just that integral image. So with this, we can very quickly calculate the sheeting of regions covered by our heart-like features. And with some other machine learning techniques, we can correlate them all together to build a classifier that will swiftly and robustly detect faces in an image. So how does this all work in our .NET program? Well, it's actually quite a bit easier than what I just described. OpenCV has a large collection of hard-like features prearranged into a model for a cascading classifier. The model is available in an XML file that can be very easily ingested using MGUCV. With that model ingested, we can construct a cascading classifier, um, and then it's as easy as running a detect method and drawing rectangles around the faces. So this is it. This is all you need to do to detect a face in .NET. Build a classifier. That's this bit right here, where I just pull in that XML file I referred to earlier. Uh, pull in the image, and then run this detect multi-scale on that image. And I actually pass um, the min size, so that's the minimum size of a face I'm looking for in this image. And then I just draw a rectangle on each face that was detected in the image. And here is actually the result of that little program run on an image of me. As you can see, it detected my face. So. That's it for how you do basic uh, face detection. Now this method is robust to different scales of an image. Um, in fact, it's almost a little too robust. You see, uh, he's still up there. So I actually ran this the first time. The reason I needed this 300 by 300 min size is because this thing is so sensitive, it picked up the face of Roger Clemens. Uh, that's, a, that's a bobblehead back there. You probably can't make it out, but that's a former Boston pitcher former Yankee pitcher, uh, Roger Clemens, whose face this thing picked up. It's that sensitive. It can detect things at that small scale. So like I said, it's invariant to scale in an image, um, but it is vulnerable to changing the fluctuations of light because it works off of relative shading in an image. So now we're going to take that same technique and apply it in a real-time application to see just how powerful it is. And for that, we're going to be using the Vonage Video API. So we're just gonna create a WPF client app, add the OpenTalk uh, client SDK to it, and add a new class implementing um, what's called an iVideo renderer called Face Detection Video Renderer, which is extending a control. An iVideo renderer is just an interface that um, the OpenTalk library uses to publish individual frames to, a, um, to your video app. Then we're gonna be adding one of those to a main XAML file, um, and we're gonna add that face detection video renderer to the layout. And we'll put that in the bottom right-hand corner and that's where we're gonna display our publisher's video. Also, we're gonna detect faces and add a connect button, we'll use those later. So now that we have that main window set up um, in main XAML CS, we're going to construct the publisher in a session. Um, ahead of time, I've gone ahead and I populated the API key in session ID and a token the API key is tied to your Vonage API, your Vonage Video API account. The session ID is just generated using um, the Vonage Video REST API, and the token is uh, JWT that your server generates for you. Um, so that all can be created dynamically as well. I'm just hard coding them for the sake of simplicity. Notice how I'm constructing this publisher here. This is um, this is where your videos, your output video is going to go. I'm passing in a publisher video, which is that face detection video render that I spoke to earlier, and that can actually detect faces. Next, we'll just need to manage connection to our video call. When your user presses the connect button, we'll flip uh, flip over, and we'll just connect to the session. If it's already been connect, if it's already connected, we'll just unpublish and disconnect from the session. The next step is when someone pushes the detect faces button, we will, for lack of a better way of phrasing it, start detecting faces. Um, now, this function is what we are going to register the uh, stream created event callback. This will create a face detection video renderer for all inbound streams, anybody else calling to the video call, and add that renderer to the layout and set the rendering mode to the current rendering mode. 
And then of course, subscribe to the stream. So now that we have the layout and the session initialization working, we need to manage the actual real-time face detection and the display of our boxes. So by having our face detection radio renderer um, implement the iVideo renderer, we are going to be able to get each frame that comes into the renderer. We're going to intercept each frame, run a facial detection on it, and then we're going to draw a rectangle on each frame to show where the face is. And finally, we're going to render the frame. So here's the beginning of our render frame function. Remember, this is going to be called each time we get a new frame. We create a writable bitmap, and that's where we're going to do our face detection and where we're going to draw our rectangle on. So essentially all we're doing here is creating a bitmap, sending the image source to the brush or the control, um, and that's effectively going to handle all the stuff for our video bitmap here. Next, we need to marshal a buffer from the frame into an image. So for detecting faces, we do just that. The image is constructed from this BGR byte type, and it's marshaled in from the buffer of the um, frame. Next, we're actually gonna add the image to, at a reduced size, we're gonna scale down the image so it's quicker to run the stuff on. I'm reducing it by a factor of four. And I'm gonna add that to this concurrent stack of images that I have uh, running in the background. And that's actually the stack that we're gonna be using to perform facial detection. Meanwhile, this bit of code here is spinning in the background. This is actually where the faces are being detected. Notice how this is operating the thread pool. We want this operation to run a different, on a different thread from the main operation so nothing is blocked because this is a WPF app. We don't want to run any blocking operations on the main thread. Um, and, that, and under the hood, this take, this, con, this blocking collection right here is just implementing a concurrent stack. And the reason we use a stack and not a queue is because the most recent and the most relevant images are one and the same. Um, and I'll get to the performance later, but I haven't seen this back up yet. Um, but anyway, moving on. Now, when we detect faces, we're going to drop into this function uh, to draw the rectangles on the bitmap. Note, we need to scale up the X and Y coordinates um, as we scale them down for the image. And I then multiply the X coordinates uh, by pixel point conversion ratio, which I needed to do because the library that I was using was drawing the rectangles in uh, points for X and pixels for Y, which is really kind of odd, but um, that was it. Um, but yeah, so getting back to performance, the a video call at best, you're gonna be getting 30 frames per second. That's like at the absolute like peak performance. It's not like a, it's not a video game. You're not gonna get like 60 or 120 FPS. Um, but at 30 FPS, this thing was able to run, um, each video frame is able to process in five to 10 milliseconds. So if you're working at 30 FPS, that's 33 milliseconds per frame. So this is really running in real time on multiple video streams. And that's because this, this technique, this Paul, uh, Viola Jones technique is so powerful for detecting faces. And so before I wrap up, let me just show that off. Um, actually, I need to go back into StreamYard and I'm going to just stop my camera real quick because I'm on Windows and if I if I try to run something else with video, it's going to mess up my camera. Um, even though it still seems to be holding my camera open, so I'm not really sure what's going to go on there. That's all right. So you're just going to see this not work with my camera real quick, but I'm fortunately dialed into this call on the other end and you'll be able to see that. So that's all right. Yeah. One sec. Yeah, well, that's working on. Uh, um, I just want to, to uh, ask the audience uh, if they have yeah questions. We feel free to uh, put them in the chat box. I mean, these are some really interesting stuff uh, um, that we're talking about here. Anyway, 
So, like I said, this is where my camera is supposed to go, but because um, of StreamYard, I guess it, I guess it's just holding my camera open for some reason. And on Windows, you can only only one application can hold your camera. So I'm just going to connect to this session, and uh, that's not good. Oh no! One sec. Uh, I think I might need to. Uh, my token expired. That's why. Give me just a moment. Yeah, so I created this. I created this session immediately before this talk, and I think it probably only had a the token only had a half uh, a life of an hour. So, so now it's. Uh, I just need to go back in and just re I just need to regenerate it. Give me one moment. Okay. okay. Uh huh. You know, it's nice when everything works the first time, but it worked. So, so if I if I tell it to start detecting faces, it's actually going to start picking up my face, and you'll see that pretty easily. Um, like I said, this actually has a profile face viewer in here too, so it could actually pick up my face and profile as well. But if I like turn my head around, or like I change the shading of my face, it can't really detect it. But if I like went back, the scale the scale works really well. And like I said, this is working in five to 10 milliseconds per frame. And if I had my camera on here, you would also see it on both ends. It would actually operate off both ends. But yeah, that's how you do face detection. Oh, no. So yeah, I hope um, you all sort of enjoyed this stroll down um, computer vision way. It's a really big field, and we really just nudge the tip of the iceberg of its potential. So before I go, let me just tell you a little bit more about me. I've been a developer for uh, going on seven years now. I consider myself a .NET developer first. Um, and I'm, like I said, the .NET developer advocate for Ponage. So I got my start working on the global positioning system, better known as GPS, and the American and UK air traffic control systems prior to moving into advocacy. On my nights and weekends, I study computer perception and robotics at Georgia Tech. Go Yellow Jackets. You can follow me on my blog, um, dev2 slash slorello or slorello.com. You also follow me on Twitter, at slorello. Um, you'll see, like, I like to do a lot of stuff related to artificial intelligence and machine learning and using, obviously, Vonage's APIs. Uh, before I go, just a little bit more about Vonage. Um, like like John said, you can send text messages with us, um, but basically any communication channel you need to talk to your customer, whether it's SMS or voice or WhatsApp or Viber or Facebook Messenger or uh, videos, like you can use us for. Um, our main documentation website is developer.nexpo.com. Um, Clarice, who organized, who set this up for us, um, gave us a coupon code for ten euro worth of free credit for um, our main API, our main APIs, and the video API comes, I think, with a ten dollar free credit too. So 
Yeah, I mean, check us out, developer.nexpo.com. So this, so here are the, some resources. Everything I showed you is available in GitHub. Um, GitHub.com slash slorello89. You'll find everything you need. Um, some other resources. I put the MGU CV documents up here. I didn't actually find them that useful. They they show you sort of how to do stuff, but I think the open open CV docs are better. Um, and for the stuff I did with the Vodage Video API, the talkbox.com slash developer slash tutorials is really helpful and developer.nextman.com for like the WhatsApp stuff that I worked, uh, showed you. So does anybody have any, are there any questions, John? All um, right, thank you very much. I, I think you should uh, turn your, yeah, yeah, there, there you go. I, just, I forgot to turn my camera back on, I apologize. <laughs> Talk That's fine. Slides. That's fine, and uh, I think we yeah. It's, uh, if it's fine, let's leave the, the the screen here so that we could give uh, some of the uh, participants uh, a chance to to um, yeah get uh, take look up some of those URLs and and and, and uh, yeah check them out for themselves. Yeah, um, really awesome talk. I've always been interested in this, and I finally have an answer. For when, uh, for for when my kid asks me, um, what's a practical use for calculus? Because I don't think there's any. <laughs> so, computer vision, computer vision is a combination of calculus and linear algebra, essentially. Exactly. What I exactly. found, at least. Yeah, and 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 I didn't realize how 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 much uh, um, um, computer vision actually used. Uh, yeah, it, I mean there were derivatives and degrees and what just you know. Um, um, you know, blown back to my mem my painful memories of failed <laughs> <laughs> calculus. That's when I was in. I, when was I was in college. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Um. Let's let's take this. Uh. Let's take this opportunity to answer some uh questions. And the first uh question that was posted in the channel was actually from from uh from 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 Luis uh Beltran, who who's uh. Who is from uh, the .NET Foundation, Joe? So, so let me take this opportunity to thank the .NET Foundation for, for, uh, for uh, well, hosting this stream and all of that. So, Luis's question was, how to decide whether to use a max pooling or average pooling? And then this was, uh, yeah, the early in the edge detection. Yeah, uh, I, was it edge detection or convolutional neural nets? For, like, I think yeah, some some somewhere around that part. Yeah, I mean, I didn't. I don't really dive too much into um, like the actual tuning of these algorithms, especially with um, CNNs. Um, but those tend to be like whatever your use case is. You need to decide. You need to sort of decide for yourself. Like what you find. What you find with these, a lot of these techniques is like, okay, well, here's how the course um, thing works for this thing. Now I have a particular application I want to apply it to, so I need to tune my algorithm. And the parameters that I'm using in my algorithm to um, essentially map onto whatever my use case is. So that's what you find. So I, I don't know if that actually answers your question or not. Um, okay, I'll, I'll let Luis figure, uh, <laughs> say if that's actually if, uh, if that actually answered his question. Anyway, we could we we could go back to it if if uh, there's per further questions. Um, yes, Luis says it's all good. All right. Cool. Uh, yeah, Francis Libertavara has, has uh, yeah three questions. Uh, so, so here's uh, how is the sample image mapped to an M, M by N matrix? Is it unrolled into intensity values per channel? So you end up with an M times N this times really question. by one matrix. Yeah. Um, I like this question. Yeah. So that go. that's a great question, Francis. Um, so. Like I said, so like I said, when you're when you're thinking about these images, um, the math abstracts out to any number of channels. I use the the two the m by n matrix because it's just simpler to think about. Um, but you can essentially convert between the different channel planes. So uh, I'm just going to rewind a little bit in my presentation. In my presentation. So we go all the way back. It's probably just easier if I popped out of this thing in the day to here. So, the, so this is that Sobel operation thing I was talking about before. You'll see the first thing I do here is I actually convert between the different color planes. 
And the reason you want to convert between the different color planes is for that exact question. Um, like it's easier to do the math on a M by N matrix than it is to do the convolution on an M by N by three matrix. Mm -hmm. You could still do it. Um, it's just a more complicated operation. And I'm not a hundred percent sure that OpenCV always supports the, uh, always supports that operation with um, larger dimension matrices. So let me let me pop back over to the that last slide there. So um, I think that should have answered his question though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so, so essentially what you're saying is that uh, uh, for your example, at least, you convert it into grayscale first and then they're, they're work with that so that you exactly. have an M by N. All right. Yeah, precisely. And like a lot of a lot of these techniques, like the first thing you do is convert to grayscale, um, blur the uh -huh. image, and then you run you yeah. run whatever it is over it. Probably in most, I would guess in most CNNs, most convolutional neural networks, um, the first thing you do is convert it to uh Convert it between color scales and um, what is it? Gray out the image or gray out the image or resize it and stuff like that. So these are all operations that you can perform on the image. And as long as you're preserving the kernels that you're using as you're convolving the thing, it, it maintains everything for you. You're, there's really not a lot of loss unless you're resizing the image. When you resize an image, you actually do lose information or gain, uh, you lose information in both directions actually. Um, yep. I didn't get into it, but it really interesting operation is resizing. When you downscale an image, what you do is you actually delete each, uh, you delete every other uh, row and column from the image, and then you run a convolution over it to actually pull the information back in and to make it a more sensible object that you have, a more sensible image that you have at the end of it. Yeah, I guess that's how some of the anti-aliasing works uh, uh, so so that it, you, you don't end up with just because if you just take out the pixels right it will be yeah. some it's just gonna be like a bunch of weird lines right uh -huh. you need to you need to sort of reconstruct an image from the downscaled image yeah yeah all right all right cool uh francis has a few more questions um there when you mentioned that you do not have to tune your uh neural network does that mean that the hyperparameters are chosen for you like the size of the first feature map you feed to the first layer? I, I mean, I, I didn't say that I didn't tune anything. So like I never tuned anything in that inception model that I was using for the uh, the CNN. That was just like a, an example of like how to do something. But yeah, you have to tune your hyperparameters usually based off of what um, your application is. Ah, all right. So, so, so it's based on what you intend to do with it. Yeah. Right, that's cool. Right, and in the WhatsApp demo, every time we upload a new picture, is the model retrained? If I if I tell it to, if I tell it that this is a like this is a greyhound, yeah, it just retrains it retrains the model. So it it preserves the pipeline. And you know what? Since I mean, we have actually a really good crowd here, so I'll just show you the pipeline that I built. Mm -hmm. This thing, it's a very simple one. It's not there's nothing too complicated going on here. Um, So this pipeline here, it's just basically, it, resize, it loads the images, resizes them, it pulls the pixels out of them, um, and then it loads everything into this, this TensorFlow model. That's the inception model that I spoke about earlier. And then it loads everything into the, the second, the last hidden layer of it. And then the, effectively the output layers become the, um, predicted label value for the output. And I preserve this pipeline here. And actually in this ad training image, so you saw earlier, I like, I took like this picture of my dog, honey. I could copy it and I could say train greyhound. And then I send the picture of honey over to it. Honey's actually right on the floor right next to me right now. But it, it pulls that image in, and this is not the look, look. This is just a this is just an example. So this is not the the best tuned thing that you'll ever you'll ever see before. But it pulls it in, it saves the image, and then it loads that image as it retrains the whole model. So yeah, it's it's retraining the model whenever I tell it to do that. But if I just send this as is, it's just going to look at it's going to take that image, it's going to fit it 
or it's going to look at and see what it what it maps to in the actual neural net. Make sense? I hope it does. <laughs> yeah. I'll... Don't teach. Yeah. Anyway, um, well, Francis did have a lot of questions already, so um, I'll let him get back to. Well, oh, he says it. Okay, he's got it. Just predicting, unless it's just predicting, unless you tell it. Yes. Now. Yep. Exactly, Francis. Awesome. Awesome. Um, All right. Uh, uh, and then let's move to Glenn's question. Can we take advantage of GPUs, uh, CUDA, OpenCL, uh, with OpenCV? And if yes, how much additional effort will it take you to use it? Um, I, I, I know you can do some GPU stuff with OpenCV. I have not tried using it with uh, the CLR as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but 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 that's something. Yeah, that's that's, that's very curious. Uh, uh, for for example, for the Vonage API, if you wanted to use, uh, yeah, I know CUDA is specific to Nvidia, something like that. Uh, uh, I'm not really familiar with the space. Uh, but if you wanted to use uh, GPUs for it, uh, um, um, yeah, what what do you have to do? Is it even possible? Uh, I you know I've never I've never even heard of any hardware excel any kind of hardware acceleration supported by the Vonage video api it's not outside the realm of possibility because the Vonage video api uses the vp8 and h264 encoders um and there are lots of hardware encoders out there for um those encoders but or for those encodings oh. but i i've never specifically heard whether we use the um the hardware encoders and do any sort of hardware acceleration with them mm -hmm. did that make sense yeah yeah, I guess so. And then, uh, yeah, but like, yeah. so most, so hold on, let me just take a step back there. So, like, most of the biggest use case of the Vonage Video API by far is um, online. It's online, it's like in a browser or something like that. So, like Chrome, for example. And Chrome uses its own encoders um, that we build on top of. And those encoders uh, might or might not use hardware acceleration. I think they mostly do if it's available. The browser will take care of that for you. But um, insofar as like the feeding it through like graphics processing and stuff like that, um, that would be an interesting pipeline to set up. I'd be really interested to see an example like that, but I've not, I've certainly not built one myself. All right, all right, cool. That's fair enough. Um, not sure if there's any other questions. Luis, oh, there was there really question? good questions. Yeah, that's transfer learning. I'm talking yeah. about the particular. I think I, yeah, yeah. That's um, that's like the inception model. It's a, it's a pre-built um, convolutional neural network. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. All right. Okay. Uh, um, I do have one thing in mind, and and, and this is this is um. This is just an article that I, I, I read earlier. Actually, it's just early this morning that I, I came across it. In, in that, um, um, a lot of a lot of vision uh, applications, for example, um, um, there's uh, people are starting to use it for for practical applications like like um, online online video interviews, something like that, and. And one of the one of the, the the thing I read earlier was about uh, the study made by, by by this group of journalists around the API of, of of a startup in Germany that was using that was using machine learning uh, to do some behavioral <laughs> uh, analysis of oh, the <laughs> of the interviewees, and they 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 noted that. Even just a change in attire, a change in the background, a change in lighting uh, would do, would affect the scores of of stuff. So, so I guess I guess my question there: What do you think of that? How much sure is this stuff for you know something as advanced as as analyzing behavior? I mean, um, um, right now, right now, um, the the most practical use of 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 uh, machine you know machine vision that I know is when I go to a lo local mall here in, in in the Philippines 
there's actually a camera pointed at you measuring your temperature already. <laughs> so yeah, as a, as a precaution, as a precaution against uh, COVID, cool. <laughs> right. and 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 that's one that's the that's one application. But using it for job and inter- for for behavioral analysis and job interviews, that's that's something that's so I don't know, mission impossible. How I, far along are we? <laughs> How far along are we? Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you that there's like a practical, yeah. You can you can certainly run like sentiment analysis on video streams. Um, a colleague of mine, Michael Jolly, actually wrote a blog not too long ago where he basically took um, the Vonage Video API and he would take a capture of the screen. He would detect some. He would detect the person's face in it, and then he would pipe it up to the um, Azure Faces API, and it would like essentially detect the sentiment of the person in the frame. And it would pipe that, and and after he detected the sentiment, he actually displayed an emoji over the person's face as to whether they were happy or sad. <laughs> right. uh, but I mean, like I, I always ponder the, um, the ethical <laughs> like, yeah. in, in areas of computer vision and machine learning, and I certainly try not to parse them myself because like oh, can be a little, <laughs> can be a little mission impossible sometimes. It can be a bit, uh, yeah. scary, but I find that I find them very interesting. Yeah, it is. It is definitely interesting. It's it's becoming more, uh, it's becoming more relevant. Uh, we're starting to see similar products come up. I work with a company called PageUp, and we do a recruitment automation software, basically. So so part of that is in the interview interview processes, and and and, and some of the providers uh, that 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 uh, we're seeing out there either competing with us or wanting to partner with us is. Is, is these uh, video interview companies? So, so yeah, yeah um, certainly interesting developments. But I, yeah, I, I totally agree that, yeah, there's ethical yeah. implications to it. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, it's 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 strange, but it's a it's a we, it's an interesting world we're we're, we're living in right now. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. It definitely is, and you know, with the pandemic and everything, it's even becoming more uh, relevant as we become more. Uh, more dependent on things like computer vision for you know um, um just just remotely monitoring uh things yeah well that was a very interesting uh uh a topic it definitely definitely uh a lot more uh to be learned there um yeah um you displayed earlier a um a a was that a coupon code yes. or what was it? A, yeah, uh, for 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 the Vonage API. So I'm gonna ask uh, that from you, and and, and we're going to uh, post that in the uh, Philippine.net users group, uh, both in the Facebook group and in the in the the Facebook group, the Facebook page, and in the Twitter account. So that so that uh, yeah, uh, those those who had um, watched this video could. Could be able to use that and and yeah, just check out the Vonage API for themselves, All right? Um, okay. well, yeah. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun speaking to you. And you, you, your your group has said, I think I've given this talk a few times, and I think I've gotten some of the best questions I've gotten on this talk out of your group. It was a lot of fun. Awesome, awesome. That's good to know. That's good to know. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you very much for getting up so early for us and and, and wow. yeah, uh, uh, doing your thing. So, right. uh, yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Yeah, yeah. Have have a g- great day for the rest of your day, or go back to <laughs> go back. Yeah, to- <laughs> nah, nah, nah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. Talk to you later. Have a good one. All right. Thank you, Steve. And that is Steve Lore- Lorello from uh, Vonage, um, talking to us about uh, machine learning dot net. All right. Before we end this. Uh, before we end this talk, uh, uh, we have a few friends over, I believe, from 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 Cloud Staff. We'd like to uh, to ask, uh, yeah, to ask them to go uh, online. Um, but but while we're waiting for them, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank um, um, thank uh, the .NET Foundation for hosting this uh, stream for us. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Vonage, and a uh, shout out to 
a shout out to uh, Clarice Nang, who who, um, who who used to work for Microsoft, uh, and and she's the one who connected us with. She's working for Bonach now, and then and she's the one who who um, connected us with 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 Steve for that really great talk. And 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 now um, to present it with 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 some uh, with you know some great information for for all our uh, uh, Philippine uh, Philippine subscribers and, and those watching this live stream from uh, the Philippines. So so uh, I I'm aware that a lot of people have have been uh, looking for looking for opportunities in this pandemic for especially for remote working ones and and we have been. The Philippine.net users group has been partnered with Cloud Staff for, for, uh, for some time now, uh, working in some events together, and that's so. Um, they'd like to talk about uh, about uh, some of some of their 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 offerings for the community. So to talk to us uh, from Cloud Staff, I turn uh, this floor over to uh, Marcel Cordero. So uh, good evening, Marcel. Good evening, John. Thank you for having us uh, tonight on your very first um, online uh, dev sessions for 2021. Yep, thank that you. That was a great presentation by uh, Steve. All right. Hopefully, everyone can see my uh, presentation. Um, I'm Maricel Cordero. I'm one of the development leads at Cloud Stuff Philippines, and we are here to share with you uh, some of the dead, dead net uh, open positions in our uh, company and a brief introduction uh, about cloud stuff uh, Philippines and who we are. All right, so why do we why work at cloud stuff? Um, just to name a few, uh, you know, we're part of the global market, we have uh, clients uh, from US, uh, Australia, uh, UK, just to name a few. Uh, we have uh, flexible working um, hours and um, home arrangement. You know, with what happened uh, recently with COVID, um, we, what we realized is that um, work from home is here to stay. And uh, we are quite flexible in, in that area. Uh, we have continuous uh, development. We're actually building Cloud Stuff University um, as of the moment. And uh, most especially, you have your success managers um, for employees and clients. Uh, what the, that means is for anyone who will be joining Cloud Staff is that you will be having your support system with you to ensure that uh, you are onboarded um, properly into the company, into your client. So our goal is for you to succeed and for your client to succeed. And uh, personally, for me, you know, uh, working with cloud stuff is like a breath of uh, fresh air you know i i i earn i learn uh, at the same time so it's it, it's it's such a fun uh, company uh lots of perks actually uh do visit us at uh, www.cloudstuff.com if you would like to learn more about us and uh, now moving on to the um open roles that we have uh, for that net um we have um, here in Clark Pampanga, it's for morning shift. This is in, uh, you will be in the office. It's a uh, .NET and Xamarin uh, developer with a uh, two years uh, minimum uh, experience in software uh, dev development uh, proficiency in .NET Core, c -Shot and Xamarin, of course. Uh, there will be some front-end web development for you. That's JavaScript and um, Angular. We also have another open position in senior as a senior .NET uh, developer with at least uh, six years of experience in uh, development. And uh, this is a work from home. So anyone who is even if you're living outside of Pampanga, that's fine. This is uh, for a mid-shift uh, position. Another senior .NET developer uh, position. And this is again in Clark. This is gonna, you're going to be in the office. Uh, this is a night shift uh, position. It's for um, front end uh, development. You'll be using um, Angular in here, and uh, some of the tech stack are mentioned here. Uh, another .NET uh, developer position. Again, this is a work from home um, position. It's it's good. It's a morning shift. Um, we are looking for at least five years. Uh, experience in uh, development uh, using uh, .NET with this one. Again, take a look at the uh, technology stack 
uh, in the screen if this might uh, interest you. Another uh, open position in Clark, uh, morning shift. It's uh, five years, again, uh, experience in software development. And uh, nice to have, we have at least, um, if you have experience in Agile or Scrum, that will be that will be an advantage in the front end web development as well. Uh, this is for a software uh, development uh, developer position. I think this is for an internal position. This I think this is for my team, <laughs> the DevNet team uh, internal. This is a work from home. Uh, at least two years experience uh, is is what we need for here. Uh, again, uh, .NET uh, Angular. And that net. This is more of a front end uh, position. Uh, this is in Pampanga and it's a morning uh, shift, at least two to three years of experience in um, development. Uh, you are required, of course, you know, to be proficient in uh, C sharp and uh, that net uh, core. Uh, if you have Angular and Vue.js, that would be an advantage for you. Uh, we have uh, another open position. This is another work from home. It's morning shift. Uh, C Sharp .dot net uh, developer. This is for at least uh, you need to, to have experience in .dot net core uh, development, uh, web uh, services for SOAP and REST, and the strong um, knowledge in object oriented programming, MVC design patterns, and solid principles. Uh, lastly, we have a full stack that net uh, developer position in Clark Pampanga for morning shift. Uh, technologies required are uh, shown on the screen and familiarity with different tools such as Jira, Git, Visual Studio will be an advantage uh, for anyone who might be interested. And uh, I think we will be sharing more of this with you on, uh, I think, in PH, Fin, uh, UG uh, page. So, uh, Wait for, wait for further announcements. So do register and apply. Uh, ensure that uh, you use this um, link. It's jobs.cloudstuff.com slash register, uh, question mark, ref is equal one, four, five. Please use this link. And um, uh, we would like to request everyone to, to fill out your uh, profile and do not forget to upload. Uh, your uh, CV and uh, on our page make sure to select uh, where do you hear about cloud stuff to select um, on the drop down uh, fin uh, UG if I'm saying that correctly on the drop down again please use this uh, link to register so that you will be on our database apart from the mentioned uh, nine open roles uh, we have actually a lot more open positions that might be a good fit for our fellow .NET developers, and uh, we will match your skill, your asking salary to a potential uh, client. All right, so a quick look. Uh, this is our uh, jobs that cloud stuff. If you use that URL, um, I advise uh, everyone to register by, um, you know, manually use uh, first name, last name instead of uh, registering by Google, and uh, complete your profile, um, upload your CV, provide us uh, your skills, um, in here and uh, so you'll have an updated profile that we can present to potential clients right don't forget to share this with your colleagues as well uh we'll definitely share that link on our uh ug uh ug page uh, uh ug channels and for 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 everyone's benefit so yeah if uh, if you're looking for you know, you know, a uh, uh, a work from home job, something that yeah. Uh, that uh, yeah keeps us safe in this pandemic, right? Uh, yes. Um, yeah. Uh, these are some awesome opportunities, and yeah, even if you're not looking uh, personally, uh, please do share these uh, to to your friends, as you know, we can uh, help each other yes. uh, in in these times. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That is <laughs> it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Marcel. For, for, for that presentation okay so um i think um um that brings us to the end of this evening again we thank our friends from we thank our friends from cloud staff we thank our friends from uh, the .NET foundation and we thank our uh, our speaker from vonage for 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 that really great e evening uh of, of of learning and thank you so much for 
thank you so much to all uh, uh, the people who had been uh, in this live stream for, for, for the evening. So uh, I hope you have a good night. I hope you, uh, you, you do well. And yeah, um, um, this will be this will be recorded in the available in the YouTube channel of the Donut Foundation. So so yeah, uh, I'll feel free to share this live stream with with uh, your friends as well. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, magandang gabi. Good night, everyone. Thank you.